Chapter 10 of The Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter 10 Working the Line. Continuity Tests During Laying. As previously mentioned, two descriptions of instrument were used on board the ships for testing and working through while laying the cable. These were the detector of Mr. Whitehouse and Professor Thompson's reflecting apparatus. The process of testing consisted in sending from one to the other vessel alternately during a period of ten minutes, first a reversal every minute for five minutes, and then a current in one direction for five minutes. The results of these signals, to test the continuity of the line, were observed and recorded on board both ships. There was also a special signal for each ten miles of cable paid out between the vessels. When the splice was made on July 29th, 72 degrees deflection were obtained on the Agamemnon from 75 cells of a sawdust Daniels battery on board the Niagara, which had previously given 83 degrees. On arrival at Valentia, at 6.30 a.m. on August 5th, the deflection on the same instruments, detector and marine galvanometer, being both in circuit as before, was 68 degrees, while the sending battery power on the Niagara had fallen off at entry to 62.5 degrees through the marine galvanometer on board that vessel. These figures show that the insulation of the cable had considerably improved by submersion, and when the engineers had accomplished their part of the undertaking on August 5th, the cable was handed over in perfect condition to Mr. Whitehouse and his electrical assistant. Apparatus used in working. Unfortunately for the life of the cable, Mr. Whitehouse was imbued with a belief that currents of very high intensity or potential were the best for signaling, and he had enormous induction coils five feet long, excited by a series of very large cells, yielding electricity estimated at about 2,000 volts potential. The insulation was unable to bear the strain, and thus the signals began to gradually fail. For something like a week, the efforts to work through the cable with the above apparatus proved ineffectual, the power being constantly increased to no purpose. Professor Thompson's reflecting galvanometer, which had worked so well during the voyage, was then used again with ordinary Daniel cells. Messages In this way communication resumed the first clear message being received from Newfoundland on August 13, 1858, and after considerable delay in getting the American receiving apparatus ready, on the 16th the following was got through from the directors in England to those in the United States. Europe and America are united by telegraphy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Then followed... From Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain to His Excellency the President of the United States. The Queen desires to congratulate the President upon the successful completion of this great international work, in which the Queen has taken the greatest interest. The Queen is convinced that the President will join with her in fervently hoping that the electric cable, which now already connects Great Britain with the United States, will prove an additional link between the two nations whose friendship is founded upon their common interest and reciprocal esteem. The Queen has much pleasure in thus directly communicating with the President, and in renewing to him her best wishes for the prosperity of the United States. This message was shortly afterward responded to as follows. Washington City, the President of the United States to Her Majesty Victoria, Queen of Great Britain. The President cordially reciprocates the congratulations of Her Majesty the Queen on the success of the great international enterprise accomplished by the skill, science, and indomitable energy of the two countries. It is a triumph more glorious because far more useful to mankind than was ever won by a conqueror on the field of battle. May the Atlantic Telegraph, under the blessing of heaven, 
proved to be a bond of perpetual peace and friendship between kindred nations, and an instrument destined by divine providence to diffuse religion, civilization, liberty, and law throughout the world. In this view, will not all the nations of Christendom spontaneously unite in the declaration that it shall be forever neutral, and that its communications shall be held sacred in passing to the place of their destination, even in the midst of hostilities? James Buchanan Throughout the United States the arrival of the Queen's message was the signal for a fresh outburst of popular enthusiasm. Says Field, the next morning, August 17th, the city of New York was awakened by the thunder of artillery. A hundred guns were fired in the City Hall Park at daybreak, and the salute was repeated at noon. At this hour flags were flying from all the public buildings, and the bells of the principal churches began to ring, as Christmas bells signal the birthday of one who came to bring peace and good will to men chimes that it was fondly hoped might usher in as they should a new era ring out the old ring in the new ring out the false ring in the true that night the city was illuminated never had it seen so brilliant a spectacle such was the blaze of light around the city hall that the cupola caught fire and was consumed and the hall itself narrowly escaped destruction but one night did not exhaust the public enthusiasm for the following evening witnessed one of those displays for which New York surpasses all the cities of the world, a fireman's torchlight procession. Moreover, several wagon loads, each containing about twelve miles, of the cable left on board the Niagara, were drawn through the principal streets of the city. Similar demonstrations took place in other parts of the United States from the atlantic to the valley of the mississippi and to the gulf of mexico in every city was heard the firing of guns and the ringing of bells nothing seemed too extravagant to give expression to the popular rejoicing the english press were warm in their recognition of those to whom the nation were indebted for bringing into action the greatest invention of the age expressing belief that the effect of bringing the three kingdoms and the united states into instantaneous communication with each other will be to render hostilities between the two nations almost impossible in the future and further more was done yesterday for the consideration of our empire than the wisdom of our statesmen the liberality of our legislature or the loyalty of our colonists could ever have effected the sermons preached on the subject both in england and america were literally without number. Enough found their way into print to fill over one volume. Never had an event more deeply touched the spirit of religious enthusiasm. With further reference to the active life of the cable, the following communications have some interest. First of all, three long congratulatory messages were transmitted, one on August 18th from Mr. Peter Cooper, President of the New York, Newfoundland, and London Telegraph Company, to the directors of the Atlantic Telegraph Company, another from the Mayor of New York to the Lord Mayor of London, his reply in acknowledgment following, then two of the great Cunard mail steamers, the Europa and Arabia, had come into collision on August 14th, neither the news nor the injured vessels could reach those concerned on either side of the atlantic for some days but as soon as it became known in new york a message was sent by the cable a facsimile of the original of which is shown on page one fifty the first public news message showed the relief given by speedy knowledge in dispelling doubt and fear subsequently messages giving the news on both continents were transmitted and published daily among others, on August 27th, a dispatch was sent by the secretary of the Atlantic Telegraph Company that was remarkable for the amount of important information contained in comparatively few words. It read as follows. To Associated Press, New York. News for America by Atlantic Cable. Emperor of France returned to Paris, Saturday. King of Prussia too ill to visit Queen Victoria. Her Majesty returns to England August 30th. St. Petersburg, August 21st. Settlement of Chinese question. Chinese empire open to trade. Christian religion allowed. Foreign diplomatic agents admitted. Indemnity to England and France. 
Alexandria, August 9th. The Madras arrived at Suez, 7th instant. Dates, Bombay to the 19th, Aden 31st. Gwalior insurgent army broken up. All India becoming tranquil. The above was published in the American papers the same day. Further, as exemplifying the aid the cable afforded to the British government, mention may be made of two messages sent from the commander-in-chief at the horse guards on August 31st. Following the quelling of the Indian mutiny, they were dispatched for the purpose of cancelling previous orders which had already gone by mail to Canada. The first, to General Trollope Halifax, ran as follows. The 62nd Regiment is not to return to England the other to the officer in command at montreal the thirty ninth regiment is not to return to england from fifty thousand to sixty thousand pounds was estimated by the authorities to have been saved from the unnecessary transportation of troops by these two cable communications but the insulation of the precious wire had unhappily been giving way the high potential current from mr whitehouse's enormous induction coils were too much for it and the diminished flashes of light proved to be only the flickering of the flame that was soon to be extinguished in the eternal darkness of the waters. After a period of confused signals, the line ultimately breathed its last on October 20th, after 732 messages in all had been conveyed during a period of three months. The last word uttered, and which may be said to have come from beyond the sea, was forward. The line had been subject to frequent interruptions throughout. The wonder is that it did so much when we consider the lack of experience at that period in the manufacture of deep-sea cables, the short time allowed, and more than all the treatment received after being laid. It is indeed extremely doubtful whether any cable even of the present day would long stand a trial with current so generated and of such intensity. An unusually violent lightning storm occurred at Newfoundland shortly after the cable had been laid. This was considered a part cause of the actual failure of the line. When all the efforts of the electricians failed to draw more than a few faint whispers, a dying gasp from the depths of the sea, there ensued in the public mind a feeling of profound discouragement. But what a bitter disappointment for those officially concerned in the enterprise— in all the experience of life there are no sadder moments than those in which, after much anxious toil and striving for a great object, and after a glorious triumph, the achievement that seemed completed becomes a wreck. ENGINEERING DEMONSTRATION Still, the engineer of this great undertaking had the satisfaction of knowing that he had demonstrated, one, the possibility of laying over two thousand miles of cable in one continuous length across a by no means calm ocean at depths of two to three miles, and, two, that by the agency of an electric current distinct and regular signals could be transmitted and received throughout an insulated conductor, even when at such a depth beneath the sea, across this vast distance. The feasibility of either of these had been scouted at on all sides. Of course, the gutta-percha coverings, as then applied, cannot be compared with the methods and materials of our later days, though a great advance on that of previous cables. It was a pity that, owing to the precipitation with which the undertaking was rushed through, and the fear of failure for want of capital, more time was not given to the consideration of Bright's recommendation for a conductor four times larger with a corresponding increase in the gutta-percha insulator, under such conditions, it is highly improbable that high potentials would have ever been applied to the line. Unhappily, besides Faraday and Whitehouse, Professor Morse, when advising the board in this matter, promulgated views directly opposed to the above, as has already been shown. In the course of his report, Morse has said that by the use of comparatively small coated wires, and of electromagnetic induction coils for the exciting magnets, telegraphic signals can be transmitted through 2,000 miles, with a speed amply sufficient for all commercial and economical purposes. Still, the cable, inadequately constructed as it was from an electrical point of view, 
would probably have worked for years, though slowly, of course, had the fairly reasonable battery power employed between the ships and up to the successful termination of the expedition been continued in connection with Professor Thompson's delicate reflecting apparatus. The electrician, however, not only used much higher power immediately he took the cable in hand for working his specially devised relay and Morse electromagnetic recording instrument in connection with his enormous induction coils, but he actually increased the power from time to time up to nearly five hundred cells till the five-foot coils yielded a current urged by a potential of something like two thousand volts. Hence, when signaling was resumed, as shown by the comparatively mild voltaic currents, for actuating the Thompson apparatus, a fault, or faults, had already been developed, necessitating a far higher battery power than had been employed during the continuous communication between the ships while paying out. The wounds opened further under the various stimulating doses, the insulation was unable to bear the strain, and the circulation gradually ceased, through a cable already in a state of dissolution. End of chapter 10 Recording by Maria Casper Chapter 11 of the Story of the Atlantic Cable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter 11 The Inquest. The great historical sea line having collapsed, some of the foremost of the electrical profession were called in first to determine the nature of the interruption with a view to possible remedy next to elicit the cause expert opinions on the failure mr cromwell fleetwood varley the electrician to the electric telegraph company mr e b bright the chief of the magnetic company and mr w t henley the well-known telegraphed inventor were severally requested by the atlantic company to report on the subject in conjunction with sir charles bright and professor thomson first of all the deadline was subjected to a series of tests for this resistant coils and monsieur bright's apparatus for ascertaining the position of a fault were employed there was every evidence of a serious electrical leakage about three hundred miles from valentia but there did not appear to be any fracture in the conductor as exceedingly weak currents still came through fitfully according to the above location the main leak through the gutta percha envelope was in water of a depth of about two miles at that time means were not devised for grappling and lifting a cable from such depths but from independent tests by thomson and bright it appeared likely that the valentia shore end was also especially faulty accordingly it was under run from the catamaran raft previously used in eighteen fifty seven for some three miles but on being cut at the farthest point at which it was found possible to raise the cable the fault still appeared on the seaward side the idea of repairs had therefore to be abandoned and the cable was spliced up again the conductor being again intact efforts were made to renew signals with the curb key recently invented by m bright by means of this currents of opposite character were transmitted so that each signalling current was followed instantly by one of opposite polarity which neutralized by a proportionate strength and duration all that remained of its predecessor though this was the right principle on which to work the patient was too far gone and all efforts proved unavailing for signalling purposes the poor cable was defunct having dealt with the nature of the interruption we now come to the cause it was first of all abundantly clear from the station diaries kept by the electricians at valentia and newfoundland and by other irrefragable evidence that when the laying was completed and the cable ends were handed over to them from the ships on august fifth 
all was in good working order the authorities were unanimous in their opinion mr c f varley declared that had a more moderate power been used the cable would still have been capable of transmitting messages in giving extra force to the above opinion mr varley described an experiment he had made on the cable in conjunction with mr e b bright we attached to the cable a piece of gutta percha covered wire having first made a slight incision by a needle prick in the gutta percha to let the water reach the conductor the wire was then bent so as to close up the defect the defective wire was then placed in a jar of sea-water and the latter connected with the earth after a few momentary signals had been sent from the five-foot induction coils into the cable and consequently into the test wire the intense current burst through the excessively minute perforation rapidly burning a hole nearly one-tenth of an inch in diameter afterward increased to half an inch in length when passing the current through the faulty branch only the burned gutta percha then came floating up to the surface of the water while the jar was one complete glow of light professor hughes the inventor of the type printing telegraph and subsequently of the microphone considered that the cable was injured by the induction coils and that the intense currents developed by them were strong enough to burst through gutta percha professor wheatstone gave a similar opinion some one inquired of the electrician whether if any one touched the cable at the time when the current was discharged from the induction coil he would receive a shock sufficiently strong to cause him to faint it was admitted in reply that those who touched the bare wire would suffer for their carelessness though not if discretion be exercised by grasping the gutta percha only the chairman of the company the right hon j stuart wortley m p in the course of a deputation to lord palmerston later on stated that far too high charges of electricity were forced into the conductor it was evidently thought at the time by certain electricians that you could not charge a cable of this sort too highly thus they proceeded somewhat like the man who bores a hole with a poker in a deal board it gets the hole to be sure but the board is burned in the operation professor thompson now lord kelvin writing in eighteen sixty expressed the following opinion it is quite certain that with a properly adjusted mirror galvanometer as receiving instrument at each end twenty cells of dangell's battery would have done the work required and at even a higher speed if worked by a key devised for diminishing inductive embarrassment and the writer with the knowledge derived from disastrous experience has now little doubt but that if such had been the arrangement from the beginning if no induction coils and no battery power exceeding twenty danielle cells had ever been applied to the cable since the landing of its ends imperfect as it then was it would be now in full work day and night with no prospect or probability of failure summing up the cause of the untimely ending to the ill-used cable perhaps the concisest verdict would be in mechanical engineering parlance that high-pressure steam had been got up in a low-pressure boiler end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the story of the atlantic cable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Part 3 Intermediate Knowledge and Advance. Chapter 12 Other Proposed Routes. The gradual failure of the 1858 cable, after a short period of working, and the slow rate at which messages were capable of being transmitted naturally deterred capitalists from providing the means for another cable of such length in deep water several schemes however for a fresh line on other routes were brought forward 
and there was an alternative route between great britain and america by which the transmission of the electric current could be subdivided into four comparatively short sections this was known in eighteen sixty as the north atlantic telegraph project in which the route was from the extreme north of scotland to the faroe islands thence to iceland from there to the southern point of greenland and so on to labrador or newfoundland the distances were varying a little according to landing places selected approximately from the north of scotland to faroe islands two hundred twenty five miles from the faroe islands to iceland two hundred and eighty miles from iceland to greenland s w harbor seven hundred miles from greenland to labrador five hundred and fifty miles total one thousand seven hundred fifty five miles from the electrician's point of view these subdivisions were extremely favorable as compared with the long continuous length entailed by an atlantic cable between ireland and newfoundland then again the soundings except for a section between greenland and labrador did not yield anything approaching the more southern depths but against these obvious advantages there was the engineering objection which at first seemed insurmountable that the greenland coast was bound up by ice for a great part of the year in addition to the risk of injury to the cable from the grounding of icebergs this latter was of less moment for it could be provided against by keeping the cable when approaching shore in the middle of any inlet and thus away from the shallow sides where the icebergs ground there was also the probable difficulty of obtaining a trained staff to work a line when laid to such inhospitable regions however having regard to the anxiety exhibited by many to get to the north pole this did not present an insuperable obstacle this bold project with a route across the coldest and iciest regions of the atlantic was originally brought to the notice of the danish government by mr wilde the geographer even before the atlantic telegraph company had been established it was again introduced in a different form by colonel t p schaffner an american electrician of some note colonel schaffner made a strong case of the series of short stages geographically afforded by the north atlantic deviation after the eighteen fifty eight cable had ceased working to back up his belief in the advantages of the route which he characterized as having natural stepping-stones which providence had placed across the ocean in the north he actually charted a small sailing vessel and with his family on board put forth from boston on august twenty ninth eighteen fifty nine for the purpose of making the preliminary survey he landed in glasgow in november of that year and presented to the public the results of his voyage during the voyage colonel schaffner sounded the deep seas to be traversed between labrador and greenland and between greenland and iceland his first object was to convince the public that there were no insuperable difficulties in the way he found a warm supporter in mr j rodney Kroski of london who advanced the caution money to the danish government for the concessions requisite in the faroes iceland and greenland on may fifteenth lord palmerston granted an audience to an influential deputation headed by the right hon milner gibson m p and four other members of the house of commons to solicit the assistance of government in sending out ships and officers to make the necessary official survey for ascertaining the practicability of the proposed route the premier appeared fully to appreciate the advantages of the north about scheme and in a very short time the admiralty were directed to send out an expedition for the purpose of making the required survey the admiralty selected for this duty captain m clintock r n an officer of great experience in the navigation of the arctic seas and h m s 
bulldog was placed under his command this distinguished officer was directed to take the deep-sea soundings and he sailed from portsmouth on his mission in june eighteen sixty in the meantime the promoters of the enterprise purchased the fox the steam yacht formerly employed in the successful search for the remains of the franklin expedition and fitted her out for the purpose of making surveys of the landing places of the respective cables the fox was placed under the command of captain young of the mercantile marine an officer well known for his distinguished labors under m clintock in the franklin search at the same time dr john ray f r g s an intrepid arctic explorer volunteered his services to join the fox and take charge of the overland expeditions in the faroe isles iceland and greenland colonel schaffner as concessionaire besides two delegates on the part of the danish government lieutenant von zillau and arnold jott olafsen also accompanied the fox expedition to take part in the necessary surveys before the departure of the fox which sailed on july eighteen eighteen sixty her majesty queen victoria the prince consort and other members of the royal family honored the enterprise by a visit to that vessel while lying off osborne and showed a lively interest in the details of the expedition on the return of the expedition sir leopold m clintock wrote a full report to sir charles bright the consulting engineer of the project in this sir leopold favored the route as perfectly practicable pointing out that the ice would not really prove a difficulty and strongly approving of the original intention of a land line across iceland to fax bay as by so doing you will avoid the only part of the sea where submarine volcanic disturbances may be suspected the results of the voyages of h m s bulldog and the steam yacht fox were brought before a crowded meeting of the royal geographical society on january twenty eighth eighteen sixty one sir leopold m clintock then gave the first public account of his numerous and careful soundings along and in the vicinity of the proposed course of the cable interspersed with many useful remarks and hints as to ice the best time for laying the line and so forth as well as the probable sphere of volcanic action in and off the south of iceland the above was followed by an exhaustive paper by sir charles bright giving a synopsis of captain young's report on his voyage in the fox including the examination of various estuaries and harbors so as to enable a decision to be arrived at as to the best landing places the climatic conditions and so forth from both sets of soundings it was shown that as a rule the bottom was of ooze dr wallich the naturalist of the expedition had brought up brightly colored starfish from depths of over a mile whereas it had previously been believed that nothing could possibly live under such an enormous pressure of water then came a highly instructive paper by dr ray he gave a number of interesting particulars of his land surveys the population price of foods wages and so forth he also described the ride of the fox party across iceland while making important suggestions as to the route for the land line with a view to avoiding the geysers captain r b beechey r n afterward made a beautiful oil painting of the party including some of the eskimos on the occasion of landing to explore the inland ice at agalico fjord at this time however eighteen sixty one there was still too much discouragement owing to the stoppage and working of the first atlantic cable and to other causes with which we are about to deal moreover there were those who still feared the ice flows and in the end the public did not respond sufficiently thus after all the great north atlantic telegraph project which had been worked out with so much trouble and expense was never actually realized another scheme which attracted some attention about the same time was described as the south atlantic telegraph 
this was for a long length of cable between the south of spain and the coast of brazil touching at madeira the canary islands cape de verde isles don pedro and fernando de noranja isles on the way and stretching out to the west indies and the united states then there was a project for a cable on an intermediate route from portugal to the azores and thence to america via bermuda and the southern states being however to a great extent foreign in their scope these latter schemes found little favor in this country at the time they have however since been realized in some shape or form End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the story of the atlantic cable this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. recording by kathleen the story of the atlantic cable by sir charles bright chapter thirteen experience investigation and progress the red sea line mr lionel gisborne had obtained powers from the turkish government to carry a telegraph line across egypt and lay a cable down the red sea the importance of this line to great britain led the government to give definite assistance the first portion of the proposed cable from suez to aden with intermediate landings was laid in eighteen fifty nine the different sections broke down one by one they were all laid very taut the slack in some cases being less than one per cent though the bottom was in certain parts very uneven the second portion of the line from aden to karachi with intermediate stations was laid during eighteen sixty the slack working out at zero point one per cent only faults developed very quickly in all the sections of both portions of the line apart from the small allowance for slack the type of cable adopted was of far too fragile a nature for some of its rough reef-like rusting spots indeed the undertaking was spoken of as like running a donkey for the ledger the promoters of this enterprise having neither specially qualified men nor the necessary materials for carrying out repairs were obliged to abandon it before any commercial work had been effected this was a most unfortunate line in every way for a complete message was never got through the entire length but only through each section separately nevertheless until quite recently it cost great britain thirty six thousand pounds per annum inquiry on the construction of submarine telegraphs aroused more especially by the above failure the government in eighteen fifty nine before undertaking further responsibility resolved to thoroughly investigate the construction of cables it also felt that the ultimate failure of the atlantic line was possibly due in part to weak joints and general defects in the manufacture of the insulating envelope this committee under the direction of the board of trade with captain afterwards sir douglas galton r e in the chair devoted twenty-two sittings covering a considerable period of time to questioning engineers electricians professors physicists manufacturers and seamen who had taken part in the various branches of cable work and whose knowledge or experience might throw light on the subject investigations were instituted concerning the structure of all cables previously made and the quality of the different materials used as to special points arising during manufacture and laying on the routes taken electrical testing and on sending and receiving instruments speed of signalling and so forth actual experiments were also made in connection with this inquiry to ascertain one the electrical and mechanical qualities of copper pure and alloyed also of gutta percha and other insulating substances two the chemical change in their condition when submerged three the effects of temperature and pressure on the insulating substances employed four the elongation and breaking strain of copper wires of iron steel and tarred hemp separately and combined 
5. The phenomena connected with electrically charging and discharging conductors. 6. Methods of testing conductors and of locating faults. Besides the whole science and practice of cable making and laying, the report of the committee was not published till some time afterward. It expressed a conviction that submarine telegraphy might be made sure and remunerative in the future based on the evidence adduced regarding the proper manufacture and working of submarine telegraphs formulation of electrical standards and units this inquiry was shortly followed by an important paper before the british association for the advancement of science by sir charles bright and mr latimer clark then in partnership which put the practice of electrical testing on a systematic basis thereby considerably forwarding all electrical work connected with submarine telegraphy a committee was formed shortly afterward which gave the suggestions then brought forward the seal of universal officialdom further cables about this time a number of other cable enterprises were set afoot some in shallow water and others in comparatively great depths though few of them were able to benefit by the information obtained in the inquiry they were in the main more or less successful these projects included cables between malta and alexandria besides others in the mediterranean and elsewhere sir charles bright mr afterward sir c w siemens mr lionel gisborne and mr h c ford were mainly associated with them as engineers and electricians the line which met however with the most complete and lasting success was the first cable to india laid by sir charles bright in several sections along the persian gulf in eighteen sixty three to sixty four in this undertaking messrs bright and clark engineers to the government introduced a complete system of electrical and mechanical testing every joint was for the first time efficiently tested and the insulated core submitted to a hydraulic pressure representative of that which it would experience when laid a formula was also arrived at by an elaborate series of experiments for the effect of temperature on the insulation which showed how enormously the resistance of gutta percha increased by consolidation when submitted to the low temperatures of the bottom of the ocean chatterton's compound had been already introduced for adhering the gutta percha envelope to the wires as well as for cementing together the different insulating coats but bright and clark's preservation composition for the iron armor was first used in this enterprise this mixture not only evades the oxidation that iron wires even when galvanized are subject to but resists the attacks of the teredo and other objectionable animal life moreover besides the type of cable being eminently suitable the manufacture was carried out with extreme care and with all the advantage of experience and improved methods completion of pioneer stage with the successful termination of the above enterprise forming the first telegraphic connection between the united kingdom europe and india the science of constructing and laying submarine telegraphs was pretty definitely worked out and no very striking departure has since been introduced the pioneer stage may indeed at this juncture be said to have reached completion for this reason the rest of our narrative on the atlantic cable will be told more briefly though at greater length than the contents of this chapter recounting only the stepping stones to what was to follow end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of The Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Lewin. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Part 4 Commercial Success. Chapter 14 
The 1865 Cable and Expedition Fresh Efforts and Funds Though their cable had ceased to work, the Atlantic Telegraph Company was kept alive by the promoters. In 1862 the government was prevailed on to dispatch HMS Porcupine to further examine the ocean floor, 300 miles out from the coasts of Ireland and Newfoundland respectively. It took a considerable time to raise the full amount of capital required for another Atlantic cable, for this could only be done gradually. The Great Civil War in America stimulated capitalists to renew the undertaking. One of the main advantages adduced was, on this occasion as before, the avoidance of misunderstandings between the two countries. Another, intended by Mr. Cyrus Field as a special inducement to his fellow countrymen, was the improvement of the agricultural position of the United States, by extending to it the facilities already enjoyed by France of commanding the foreign grain markets. On this account the project was warmly supported by John Bright and other eminent free traders. Mr. Field, however, met with as little success in obtaining pecuniary support in the States as he had in connection with the previous line. His brother, Mr. H. M. Field, writes, The summer of this year, 1862, Mr. Field spent in America, where he applied himself vigorously to raising capital for the new enterprise. To this end he visited Boston, Providence, Philadelphia, Albany, and Buffalo, to address meetings of merchants and others. He used to amuse us with the account of his visit to the first city, where he was honoured with the attendance of a large array of the solid men of Boston, who listened with an attention that was most flattering to the pride of the speaker addressing such an assemblage in the capital of his native state. There was no mistaking the interest they felt in the subject. They went still further. They passed a series of resolutions in which they applauded the projected telegraph across the ocean as one of the grandest enterprises ever undertaken by man, which they proudly commended to the confidence and support of the American public. After this they went home feeling that they had done the generous thing in bestowing upon it such a mark of their approbation. But not a man subscribed a dollar. In point of fact, as before, the cable of 1865, as well as that of 1866, was provided for out of English pockets. Let us now substantiate this statement by a glance at events. The late Mr. Thomas Brassey was the first to be appealed to in England, and he supported the venture nobly. Then Mr. Pender was applied to, and here also substantial aid was forthcoming. Both these gentlemen had joined the board of the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company, which had just been formed in April 1864, as the result of an amalgamation of the Gutter Percha Company and Messrs. Glass, Elliot & Co. Mr. Pender, who had been largely instrumental in effecting this combination, became the first chairman. The Contractor's Share Shortly after the first Atlantic cable was laid, Messrs. Glass, Elliot & Co. availed themselves of the services of Mr. Canning and Mr. Clifford, whose engagements on Sir Charles Bright's staff for the Atlantic Company had terminated. Thus, with an additional staff of electricians, they had placed themselves in a position to undertake direct contracts for laying, as well as manufacturing, submarine telegraphs. They had, indeed, carried out work of this character in the Mediterranean during the year 1860, and on the amalgamation of the two businesses above mentioned into a limited liability company, their position was still further strengthened. The capital raised for the new cable by the Atlantic Telegraph Company was £600,000, and by agreeing to take a considerable proportion of their payment in Atlantic shares, the contractors practically found more than half of this amount. In the result, the undertaking became a contractor's affair from first to last. Design and Construction it will be seen that the new cable was to be an expensive one as compared with that of 1857 to 58. It was the outcome of six years' further experience, 
during which several important lines, referred to in the last chapter, had been laid. It also followed upon the exhaustive government inquiry to which allusion has been made. The actual type adopted, on the recommendation of Sir Charles Bright and other engineers who were additionally consulted, was much the same in respect to the conductor and insulator, three hundred pounds copper to four hundred pounds gutta percha per nautical mile, as that which the former had suggested for the previous Atlantic line. This combination for the length involved was based on Professor Thompson's law for the working speed of a cable, as depending inversely on the resistance of the conductor as well as on the electrostatic capacity of the core. The armour consisted of a combination of iron and hemp, each wire being enveloped in manila yarns. The object of encasing the separate wires in hemp was one, to protect them from rust due to exposure to air and water, and two, to reduce the specific gravity of the cable, with a view to rendering it more capable of supporting its own weight in water. This form of cable, bearing a stress of about eight tons, and suspending eight miles of itself, was considered by most of the authorities at that period to perfectly fulfil the conditions required for deep-sea lines. The claims of light hempen cables, without any iron, had been urged for meeting the difficulty of lay and recovery in deep water. And this type formed a sort of compromise, its total diameter being 1.1 inch, weighing 1 ton 1600 weight in air, and only 1400 weight in water. The shore end was to have a further outer sheathing of 12 strands, each strand containing three stout galvanised iron wires of number 2 BWG, bringing the weight up to 20 tonnes per mile. This was to be joined onto the main deep-sea type by a gradually tapering length of 25 fathoms. Arrangements for laying It was determined that this time the cable must be laid in one length, with the exception of the shore ends, by a single vessel. There was but one ship that could carry such a cargo. This ship was the Great Eastern, the conception of that distinguished engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel. She was in course of construction by the late Mr. Scott Russell at the time of the first cable, and it was a subject for regret that she was not then available. An enormous craft of 22,500 tonnes, she did not prove suitable at the time as a cargo boat, and the laying of the second Atlantic cable was the first piece of useful work she did, after lying more or less idle for nearly ten years. It is sad to think of the way this poor old ship was metaphorically passed from hand to hand. Even at this period, three separate companies had already been formed one after the other to work her. As promoter and chairman of one of these, Mr. afterwards Sir Daniel Gooch, took an active part in arranging for her charter on this undertaking and it was in this way that he became a prominent party in the enterprise. All the cable machinery was fitted to the Great Eastern on behalf of the Telegraph Construction Company by Mr. Henry Clifford, to the designs of Mr. Canning and himself. It was constructed and set up by the famous firm of engineers Messrs. John Penn and Son of Greenwich. In the main principles the apparatus employed was similar to that previously adopted in 1858 on the Agamemnon and Niagara. There were, however, several modifications introduced as the result of the extra experience gained during the seven years' interval. The main point of difference was the further application of jockeys to the paying-out gear in a more complete form. As it was not practical to moor so enormous a vessel off the works at East Greenwich, the cable had to be cut into lengths and coiled on two pontoons, and thence transferred to the big ship. Landing the Irish End At length, all the cable having been manufactured and shipped from the Greenwich works, the Great Eastern, under the command of Captain, later Sir James Anderson, left the Thames on July the 23rd, 1865, with a total dead weight of 21,000 tonnes, and proceeded to Foilhommeren Bay, Valencia.
Here she joined up her cable to the shore end, which had been laid a day earlier by S.S. Caroline, a small vessel, chartered and fitted up for the purpose. The great ship then started paying out as she steamed away on her journey to America, escorted by two British men of war, the Terrible and the Sphinx. The Sailing Staff On behalf of the contractors, Mr. afterwards Sir Samuel Canning, was the engineer in charge of the expedition, with Mr. Henry Clifford as his chief assistant. As we have seen, both these gentlemen had been engaged with Sir Charles Bright on the first line, besides having much experience in mechanical engineering, as well as in cable work. On the contractor's engineering staff there were also Mr. John Temple and Mr. Robert London. Mr. C. V. de Sauti served as chief electrician, assisted by Mr. H. A. C. Saunders and several others. By arrangement with the Admiralty, Staff Commander H. A. Moriarty, R.N., acted as navigator of the expedition. Captain Moriarty was possessed of great skill in this direction, a fact which had been made clear in the previous undertaking. The Atlantic Telegraph Company was represented on board by Professor Thompson and Mr. C. F. Varley as electricians, the former acting mainly as scientific expert in a consultative sense. Mr. Willoughby Smith, the electrician to the Gutta Percha works, was also on board at the request of the contractors, though holding no exact official position. Both Mr. Field and Mr. Gooch accompanied the expedition, the former as the initial promoter of the enterprise, and the latter on behalf of the Great Eastern Company. Representing the press, there were also on board Dr. afterwards Sir W. H. Russell, the well-known correspondent of the Times, as the historian of the enterprise, and Mr. Robert Dudley, an artist of repute, who produced several excellent sketches of the work in its different stages for the illustrated London news. A bad start. Unfortunately, trouble soon arose. The first fault declared itself the day after starting, when eighty-four miles had been paid out. It was decided to pick up back to the fault, which was discovered after ten and a half miles had been brought on board. A piece of iron wire was found to have pierced the cable diametrically, so as to make contact between the sea and the conductor. The faulty portion was cut out, and the paying out resumed as soon as the cable was spliced up again. On July the 29th, when 716 miles had been laid, another and more serious fault appeared. The arduous operation of picking up again commenced. After nine hours' work the fault was safe in board and the necessary repair effected. On stripping the cable another piece of iron wire was discovered sticking right through the core. Anxiety and misgivings were now felt by all on board, for it seemed that such reverses could only be attributed to malevolence. On August the 2nd yet a further fault was reported. They were now two-thirds of the way across, 1,186 miles of cable being already laid. Again they had to pick up, and this time in a depth of 2,000 fathoms. One mile only had been recovered, when an accident of some kind happened to the machinery. The great ship, having stopped, was at the mercy of the wind and swell, and heavy strains were brought on the cable, which consequently suffered badly in two places. Before the two injured portions could be secured on board, the cable parted and sank. Mr. Canning at once decided to endeavour to recover the cable, notwithstanding the fact that it lay in two thousand fathoms. After manoeuvring in this way for about fifteen hours, seven hundred fathoms of rope had been hove in, when one of the connecting links gave way and all beyond it sank to the bottom. The work was recommenced with hempen rope, two miles further west, in a depth of 2,300 fathoms, and on August the 8th the cable was again hooked, but when raised to within 1,500 fathoms of the surface, yet another connecting link parted, the strain being about nine tons. Two more attempts were made, but both were doomed to end in failure. The store of rope being now quite exhausted, the work had to be abandoned, and on August the 11th, 1865, 
the fleet of ships parted company to return home, shattered in hopes as well as in ropes. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Lewin. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter fifteen. Second and successful attempt. The results of the last expedition, disastrous as they were from a financial point of view, in no wise abated the courage of the promoters of the enterprise. During the heaviest weather the Great Eastern had shown exceptional stiffness, while her great size and her manoeuvring power, afforded by the screw and paddles combined, seemed to show her to be the very type of vessel for this kind of work. The picking-up gear, it was true, had proved insufficient but with the paying-out machinery no serious fault was to be found. The feasibility of grappling in mid-Atlantic had been demonstrated, and they had gone far toward proving the possibility of recovering the cable from similar depths. FURTHER FUNDS To overcome financial difficulties, the Atlantic Telegraph Company was amalgamated with a new concern, the Anglo-American Telegraph Company, which was formed mainly by those interested in the older business, with the object of raising fresh capital for the new and double ventures of 1866. The ultimate capital of this company amounted, as before, to £600,000. In raising this, Mr. Field first secured the support of the late Sir Daniel Gooch MP, then chairman and previously locomotive superintendent of the Great Western Railway Company who, after what he had seen on the previous expedition, promised, if necessary, to subscribe as much as £20,000. On the same conditions, Mr. Brassi expressed his willingness to bear one-tenth of the total cost of the undertaking. Ultimately, the Telegraph Construction Company led off with £100,000, this amount being followed by the signatures of ten directors interested in the contract as guarantors at £10,000 apiece. Then there were four subscriptions of £5,000, and some of £2,500 to £1,000, principally from firms participating in the subcontracts. These sums were all subscribed before even the prospectus was issued or the books opened to the public. The remaining capital then quickly followed. The Telegraph Construction Company, in undertaking the entire work, were to receive £500,000 for the new cable, in any case, and if it succeeded, an extra £100,000. If both cables came into successful operation, the total amount payable to them was to be £737,140. In fact, it was, if possible, even more of a contractor's enterprise than that of 1865. It was now proposed not only to lay a new cable between Ireland and Newfoundland, but also to repair and complete the one lying at the bottom of the sea. A length of 1,600 miles of cable was ordered from the contractors. Thus, with the unexpended cable from the last expedition, the total length available when the expedition started would be 2,730 miles, of which 1,960 miles were allotted to the new cable and 697 to complete the old one, leaving 113 miles as a reserve. Fresh Provisions The new main cable was similar to that of the year before, but the shore end cable determined on in this case was of a different description. It had only one sheathing, consisting of 12 contiguous iron wires of great individual surface and weight and outside all a covering of tarred hemp and compound. That part of the line which was intended for shallow depths was composed of three different types. Starting from the coast of Ireland, eight miles of the heaviest was to be laid, then eight miles of an intermediate type, and lastly fourteen miles of a lighter type, making thirty miles of shoal water cable on the Irish side. Five miles of shallow water cable, of the different types named, were considered sufficient on the Newfoundland coast, 
the previous paying-out machinery on board the great eastern was altered to some extent by messrs penn to the instruction of messrs canning and clifford though different in detail the main improvements over the eighteen sixty five gear consisted in the fact that a seventy horsepower steam engine was fitted to drive the two large drums in such a way that the paying-out machinery as in eighteen fifty eight could be used to pick up cable during the laying if necessary thereby avoiding the risk incurred by changing the cable from the stern to the bows this addition of pen trunk engines as well as the general strengthening of the entire machinery was made in accordance with the designs of mr henry clifford the picking up machinery forward after the previous expedition was considerably strengthened and improved with spur wheels and pinion gearing it had two drums worked by a similar pair of seventy horsepower engines this formed an exceedingly powerful machine and reflected great credit on those who devised and constructed it similar gear was fitted up on board the two vessels s s medway and s s albany chartered to assist the great eastern for the purpose of grappling the eighteen sixty five cable twenty miles of rope were manufactured which was constituted by forty-nine iron wires separately covered with manila hemp six wires so served were laid up strandwise round a seventh which formed the heart or core of the rope this rope would stand a longitudinal stress of thirty tons before breaking in addition five miles of boy rope were provided beside boys of different shapes and sizes the largest of which would support a weight of twenty tons. As on the previous expedition, several kinds of grapnels were put on board, some of the ordinary sort, and some with springs to prevent the cable surging and thus escaping while the grapnel was still dragging on the bottom. Others again were fashioned like pinchers, to hold or jam the cable when raised to a required height, or else to cut it only, and so take off a large proportion of the strain previous to picking up most of this apparatus was furnished by messrs brown lennox and co the famous chain cable anchor and buoy engineers several of the grapnels being to their design as well as the connections the propelling machinery of the great eastern had similarly received alteration and improvement in the intervals of the two expeditions moreover the screw propeller was surrounded with an iron cage to keep the cable and ropes from fouling it as had been provided for the agamemnon and niagara in eighteen fifty seven the testing arrangements had been perfected by mr willoughby smith in such a way that insulation readings could be continuously observed even while measuring the copper resistance or while exchanging signals with valencia thus there was no longer any danger of a fault being paid overboard without instant detection on this occasion also condensers were applied to the receiving end of the cable having the effect of very materially increasing indeed sometimes almost doubling the working speed on june thirtieth eighteen sixty six the great eastern steaming from the thames followed by the medway and albany arrived at Valencia, where HMS Terrible and Raccoon were found, under orders to accompany the expedition. The Medway had on board forty-five miles of deep-sea cable, in addition to the American shore end. The principal members of the staff acting on behalf of the contractors in this expedition were the same as in that of the previous year. Mr. Canning was again in charge, with Mr. Clifford and Mr. Temple as his chief assistants. In the electrical department, however, the Telegraph Construction Company had since secured the services of Mr. Willoughby Smith as their chief electrician, while he still acted in that capacity at the Wharf Road Gutter Percher Works. Mr. Smith, therefore, accompanied the expedition as chief electrician to the contractors. Captain James Anderson and Staff Commander H. A. Moriarty, R.N., were once more to be seen on board the great ship, the former as her captain, and the latter as navigating officer. Professor Thompson was aboard as consulting electrical adviser to the Atlantic Telegraph Company, while Mr. C. F. Varley was ashore at Valencia as their electrician. Sir Charles Bright, then MP for Greenwich, was at this period serving on various committees of the House of Commons, but his partner, Mr. Latimer Clark, took up quarters at Valencia to personally represent the firm as consulting engineers to the Anglo-American Telegraph Company. Mr. J. C. Laws and Mr. Richard Collett 
being respectively aboard and ashore at the Newfoundland end in the same interests. Mr. Glass, the managing director of the Telegraph Construction Company, was ashore at Valencia for the purpose of giving any instructions to his, the contractor's, staff on board, while Mr. Gooch and Mr. Field were aboard the Great Eastern as onlookers and watchers of their individual interests. Cable Laying Again on July the 7th, the William Corey, commonly known as the Dirty Billy, landed the shore end in Foilhomerum Bay, and afterwards lay 27 miles of the intermediate cable. On the 13th, the Great Eastern took the end on board, and having spliced onto her cable on board, started paying out. The track followed was parallel to that taken the year before, but about 27 miles farther north. There were two instances of fouls in the tank, due to broken wires catching neighbouring turns and flakes, and thus drawing up a whole bundle of cable in an apparently inextricable mass of kinks and twists, quite close to the brake drum. In each case the ship was promptly got to a standstill, and all hands set to, unravelling the tangle. With a certain amount of luck, coupled with much care, neither accident ended fatally, and after straightening out the wire as far as possible, paying out was resumed. Successful Completion Fourteen days after starting, the Great Eastern arrived off Heart's Content, Trinity Bay, where the Medway joined on and landed the shore end, partly by boats, thus bringing to a successful conclusion this part of the expedition. The total length of cable laid was 1,852 nautical miles, Average depth, 1,400 fathoms. Rejoicings then took place during the coaling of the Great Eastern, to provide for which as many as six coal-laden steamers had left Cardiff some weeks before. The rejoicings were somewhat damped by the fact that the cable between Newfoundland and Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, still remained interrupted, and that consequently the entire telegraphic system was not even now completed. However, in the course of a few days this line was repaired, and New York and the east of the United States and Canada were once more put into telegraphic communication with Europe. The telegraphic fleet put to sea again on August the 9th. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of the Story of the Atlantic Cable。this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Lewin. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter 16. Recovery and Completion of the 1865 Cable. Prospects and Plans. It now remained to find the end of the cable lost on August the 2nd, 1865, situated about 604 miles from Newfoundland, to pick it up, splice onto the cable remaining on board, and finish the work so unfortunately interrupted the year before. The difficulties to be overcome can be readily imagined, the cable lying 2,000 fathoms, without mark of any kind to indicate its position. The boys put down after the accident had long since disappeared, either their moorings having dragged during various gales of wind, or the wire ropes which held them having chafed through, owing to incessant rise and fall at the bottom. The position of the lost end had to be determined by astronomical observations. These necessitate clear weather, and can then only give approximate results on account of the variable ocean currents, which sometimes flow at the rate of three knots. Moreover, for grappling and raising the cable to the bows, the sea must be tolerably smooth, and in that part where the work lay, a succession of fine days is rare, even in the month of August. However, they still had on board Captain Moriarty, one of the ablest navigators in the world. Added to this, the greater portion of the cable in deep water had been paid out with about 15% slack. The chiefs of the expedition, fully confident of success, hastened their preparations, and on August the ninth, 1866, the Great Eastern again put to sea, accompanied by S.S. Medway. On the 12th the vessels arrived on the scene of action, and joined company with H.M.S. Terrible and S.S. Albany, 
these vessels having left Hearts Content Bay a week in advance to buoy the line of the 1865 cable and commence grappling. The plan decided on was to drag for the cable near the end with all three ships at once. The cable when raised to a certain height was to be cut by the Medway stationed on the westward of the Great Eastern so as to enable the latter vessel to lift the Valentia end on board. This was, of course, before the days of cutting and holding grapnels as we now have them, which render it possible for a single ship to effect repairs, even where it is out of the question to recover the cable in one bite. Setting to work, repeated failures. When the Great Eastern arrived on the grappling ground, the Albany, with Mr. Temple in engineering charge, had already hooked and buoyed the cable but the boy chain having been carried away they not only lost the cable but two thousand fathoms of wire rope besides on august the thirteenth the great eastern made her first drag about fifteen miles from the end and after several vain attempts the cable was finally hooked and lifted about thirteen hundred fathoms during the operation of buoying the grappling rope a mistake occurred which resulted in the rope slipping overboard and going to the bottom the Great Eastern now proceeded six miles to the eastward, and commenced a new drag for raking the ocean bed with 2,400 fathoms of wire rope. About eleven o'clock at night the grapnel came to the surface with the cable caught on two of the prongs. Boats were quickly in position alongside the grapnel. Shortly afterwards they were endeavouring to secure the cable to the strong wire rope by means of a nipper when the grapnel canted, allowing the line to slip away from the prongs like a great eel and disappear into the sea. On the 19th the cable was once more hooked and raised about a mile from the bottom, but the sea was too rough for buoying it. During the following week all three vessels dragged for the cable at different points, according to the plan previously arranged, but the weather was unfavourable, and the cable was not hooked, or if hooked had managed to slip away from the grapnels. The ship's company about this time became discouraged. In fact, more and more convinced of the futility of their efforts. On the 27th the Albany signalled that they had got the cable on board, with a strain of only three tons, and had buoyed the end, but it was soon discovered that her buoy was thirteen miles from the track of the cable, and that she had recovered a length of three miles which had been purposely paid overboard a few days before. Shifting round to the eastward, about fifteen miles, the vessels were now working in a depth of two thousand five hundred fathoms. As the store of grappling rope was diminishing day by day, and the fine season rapidly coming to an end, it was decided to proceed at once eighty miles farther east, where the depth was not expected to exceed one thousand nine hundred fathoms, and there try a last chance. Ultimate Triumph After the above repeated failures, the cable was hooked on August the 31st by the Great Eastern, when the grapnel had been lowered for the thirtieth time and picking up commenced in very calm weather. The monster vessel did her work admirably. To quote the words of an eyewitness, so delicately did she answer her helm and coin in the film of thread-like cable that she put one in mind of an elephant taking up a straw in its proboscis. When the bite of cable was about nine hundred fathoms from the surface, the grappling rope was buoyed. The big ship then proceeded to grapple three miles west of the buoy, and the medway, with Mr. London on board, another two miles or so west of her again. The cable was soon once more hooked by both ships, and when the Medway had raised her bite to within three hundred fathoms of the surface, she was ordered to break it. The Great Eastern, having stopped picking up when the bite was eight hundred fathoms from the surface, proceeded to resume the operation as soon as the intentional rupture of the cable had eased the strain which, with a loose end of about two nautical miles, at once fell from ten or eleven tons to five tons. Slowly but surely, and amid breathless silence, the long-lost cable made its appearance at last, for the third time above water, a little before one o'clock early morn of September the 2nd. Two hours afterward the precious end was on board, and signals were immediately exchanged with Valencia. This was at once led into the testing-room, where Mr. Willoughby Smith, in the presence of all the leaders on board, applied the tests which were to determine the important question regarding the condition of the cable, and whether it was entirely continuous to each end. In a few minutes all suspense was relieved, 
the test showed the cable to be healthy and complete, and immediately afterward, in response to the ship's call, the answering signals were received from the Valencia end, which were received with loud cheers that echoed and re-echoed throughout the great ship. Electricians Ashore Spot Watching Let us now look at those patiently watching, day after day, night after night, in the wooden telegraph cabin on shore, the experience of whom may be taken as a fair sample of that of the electrician ashore during repairing operations in the present day. Such a length of time had elapsed since the expedition left Newfoundland that the staff at Foyle Homerum, under the superintendence of Mr. James Graves, felt they were almost hoping against hope. Suddenly, on a Sunday morning at quarter to six, while the tiny ray of light from the reflecting instrument was being watched, the operator observed it moving to and fro upon the scale. A few minutes later the unsteady flickering was changed to coherency. The long speechless cable began to talk, and the welcome assurance arrived. Chip to shore! I have much pleasure in speaking to you through the 1865 cable, just going to make splice. Glad tidings were also sent from the ship via Valencia to London, and, by means of the 1866 cable, to Newfoundland and New York. Thus it happened that those being tossed about in a stormy sea held conversation with Europe and America at one and the same time. Putting Through The recovered end was spliced on without delay to the cable on board, and the same morning at seven o'clock the Great Eastern started paying out about 680 nautical miles of cable towards Newfoundland. On September the 8th, when only 13 miles from the Bay of Hearts Content, just after receiving a summary of the news in the Times of that morning, the tests showed a fault in the cable. The mischief was soon found to be on board the ship, and caused by the end of a broken wire, which, bending at right angles under the weight of the men employed in the tanks, had been forced into the core. This occurrence explained the probable cause of the faults of same character which had shown themselves during paying out the year before, tending to remove all suspicion of malicious intent. The faulty portion having been cut out, and the splice made without delay, paying out again proceeded finishing the same day at eleven o'clock in the forenoon. The Medway immediately set to work laying the shore end, and that evening a second line of communication across the Atlantic was completed. The total length of this cable, commenced in 1865, was 1,896 miles, average depth 1,900 fathoms. Pioneering the main feature and accomplishment in connection with the second and third Atlantic cables of 1865 and 1866 was without doubt the recovery of the former in deeper water than had ever before been effected, and in open ocean. Just as in the first 1858 line, it was the demonstration of the fact that a cable could be successfully laid in such a depth and worked through electrically. In the interval between the two undertakings, cable repairs had certainly been carried out in the Mediterranean in 1,400 fathoms. Moreover, the recovery and repair of a cable from the depths of the ocean are now matters of ordinary everyday occurrence, forming part and parcel of cable operations generally. These facts should not, however, in any way detract from the greatness of the achievement at that time in so vast and boisterous an ocean. Working the Two Lines Professor Thompson's reflecting apparatus for testing and signalling had been considerably improved since the first cable. In illustration of the degree of sensibility and perfection attained at this period in the appliances for working the line, the following experiment is of striking interest. Mr. Latimer Clark, who went to Valencia to test the cable for the Atlantic Company, had the conductor of the two lines joined together at the Newfoundland end thus forming an unbroken length of 3,500 miles in circuit. He then placed some pure sulphuric acid in a silver thimble, with a fragment of zinc weighing a grain or two. By this primitive agency he succeeded in conveying signals twice through the breadth of the Atlantic Ocean in little more than a second of time after making contact. 
The deflections were not of a dubious character, but full and strong, the spot of light traversing freely over a space of twelve inches or more, from which it was manifest that an even smaller battery would suffice to produce somewhat similar effects. Again, in testing these cables, it was found that if either was disconnected from the earth and charged with electricity, it required more than an hour for half of the charge to escape through the insulating material to the earth. This speaks well for the electrical components assigned to the two lines, and for the arrangements adopted in working them. It also shows the benefit derived from seven years of extra experience in manufacture, backed up by the previously mentioned exhaustive government inquiry thereon. Notwithstanding the dimensions of the core, these cables were worked slowly at first, and at a rate of about eight words per minute. This, however, soon improved, as the staff became more accustomed to the apparatus, and steadily increased up to fifteen, and even seventeen words per minute on each line, with the application of condensers. Unfortunately, both these cables broke down a few months later, and one of them again during the following year. The faults were localised with great accuracy from heart's content by Mr. F. Lambert, on behalf of Messrs. Bright and Clark, engineers to the Anglo-American Company. Unlike the 1858 line, however, these last cables had not been killed electrically, and being worthy of repairs, they were maintained for a considerable time. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Story of the Atlantic Cable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter 17 Jubilations. On the return of the 1866 expedition, a banquet was given to the cable layers by the Liverpool Chamber of Commerce as soon as the Great Eastern was safely moored in the Mersey. The following from the Times will be of some interest here. The chair was occupied by the Right Honourable Sir Stafford Northcote, Bart, President of the Board of Trade. The following were among the invited guests. The Right Honourable Lord Stanley, MP, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. The Right Honourable Lord Carnarvon, The Right Reverend the Lord Bishop of Chester. The Right Honourable W. E. Gladstone, MP. Sir Charles Bright, MP, original projector of the Atlantic Cable, and engineer to the Anglo-American Telegraph Company, Professor W. Thompson, electrical advisor to the Atlantic Telegraph Company, Mr. Latimer Clark, co-engineer with Sir Charles Bright, Mr. R. A. Glass, managing director to the Telegraph Construction Company, contractors, Mr. Samuel Canning, engineer to the contractors, Mr. Henry Clifford, assistant engineer to the contractors, Mr. Willoughby Smith, electrician to the contractors, Captain James Anderson, commander of the Great Eastern, Mr. William Barber, chairman of the Great Ship Company, Mr. John Chatterton, manager of the Gouda Percha Works, Mr. E. B. Bright, Magnetic Telegraph Company, Mr. T. B. Horsfall, M.P., and Mr. John Laird, M.P., after proposing toast to Her Majesty the Queen, to the President of the United States, and to the Prince of Wales, the Chairman, Sir S. Northcote, again rose amid applause and said it was a maxim of a great Roman poet that a great work should be begun by plunging into the middle of the subject. He would therefore do so by proposing a toast to the projectors of the Atlantic Telegraph, Sir Charles Bright and Mr. Cyrus Field mr j w brett having since unfortunately died when they came in after years to relate the history of this cable they would find many who had contributed to it but it would be as impossible to say who were the originators of the great invention as it was to say who were the first inventors of steam he begged to couple with the toast the name of sir charles bright as perhaps the foremost representative from all points of view up to the present time applause the greatest honor is due to the indomitable 
perseverance and energy of sir charles bright that the original cable was successfully laid though through no fault of his it had but a short useful existence great cheering sir charles bright m p after acknowledging the compliment paid to the original projectors and to himself personally said that the idea of laying a cable across the atlantic was the natural outcome of the success which was attained in carrying short lines under the english and irish channels and was a common subject of discussion among those concerned in telegraph extension prior to the formation of the atlantic telegraph company about ten years ago the science had sufficiently advanced to permit of the notion assuming a practical form soundings taken in the atlantic between ireland and newfoundland proved that the bottom was soft and that no serious currents or abrading agencies existed for the minute and fragile shells brought up by the sounding line were perfect and uninjured there only remained the proof that electricity could be employed through so vast a length of conductor upon this point and the best mode of working such a line he had been experimenting for several years he had carried on a series of investigations which resulted in establishing the fact that messages could be practically passed through an unbroken circuit of more than two thousand miles of insulated wire a notion derided at that time by many distinguished authorities mr wildman whitehouse who subsequently became electrician to the company had been likewise engaged on comparing notes later it was discovered that we had arrived at similar results though holding somewhat different views for his sir c bright's calculations using other instruments led him to believe that a conductor nearly four times the size of that adopted would be desirable with a slightly thicker insulator it was this type which the new cables just laid had been furnished with in eighteen fifty six mr cyrus field to whom the world was as much indebted for the establishment of the line as to any other man came over to england upon the completion of the telegraph between nova scotia and newfoundland he then joined with the late mr brett and himself sir c bright with the view of extending this system to europe and they mutually agreed as also did mr whitehouse later to carry out the undertaking a meeting was first held in liverpool and in the course of a few days their friends had subscribed the necessary capital so that in greeting those who had just returned from the last expedition mr canning mr clifford captain anderson and other guests of the evening liverpool was fitly welcoming those who had accomplished the crowning success of an enterprise to which at the outset she had so largely contributed applause the circumstances connected with the first cable would be in the recollection of every one and although the loss was considerable the experience gained was of no small moment a few months after the old line had ceased to work their chairman sir s northcote consulted him on behalf of the government as to the best form of cable for connecting us telegraphically with gibraltar and he sir c bright did not hesitate to recommend the same type of conductor and insulator which he had himself before suggested for the atlantic line a higher speed being desirable this class of conductor in the newly laid atlantic cable appeared likely to give every satisfaction he was happy to say and the mechanical construction of the cable also the same as that he had previously specified for the gibraltar line appeared to have admirably met some of the difficulties experienced in cable operations the credit attached to these second and third atlantic cables must mainly rest with the telegraph construction company formerly messrs glass elliott and company and their staff inasmuch as in this case the responsibility rested with them throughout the directors mr glass mr elliott mr gooch mr pender mr barclay and mr brassey deserve the reward which they and the shareholders would now reap to mr glass upon whom the principal responsibility of the manufacture devolved the greatest praise was due for his indomitable perseverance in the enterprise 
than the art of insulating the conducting wire had been so wonderfully improved by mr chatterton and mr willoughby smith that nowadays a very feeble electrical current was sufficient to work the longest circuits an enormous advance on the state of affairs nine years previously again they must not forget how much of the success now attained was due to professor thompson and his delicate signalling apparatus the advantages of which have since eighteen fifty eight been more firmly established mr varley had also done most useful work since becoming electrician to the atlantic company moreover he sir c bright hoped the active personal services of his partner mr latimer clark would not be forgotten it was satisfactory to find that the cables were already being worked at a very large profit this system would doubtless be quadrupled within a short period when the land lines on the american side were improved hear hear and applause with this commercial success combined with the improvements introduced into submarine cables and the power of picking up and repairing them from vast depths there was a future for submarine telegraphy to which scarcely any bounds could be imagined a certain amount had already been done but china and japan australia and new zealand south america and the west india islands must all be placed within speaking distance of england when this last had been accomplished but not till then telegraphic engineers might take a short rest from their labors and ask with some little pride quo regio in terris nostri non pleno laboris loud applause then followed speeches from lord stanley the american consul on behalf of mr cyrus field and others honors were subsequently bestowed on some of the various gentlemen most immediately concerned in these at last wholly successful undertakings of eighteen sixty five and eighteen sixty six which left their results behind in complete and lasting form End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the story of the atlantic cable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the story of the atlantic cable by sir charles bright chapter eighteen subsequent atlantic lines as a natural sequence other atlantic cables followed in course of time thus in eighteen sixty nine france was put into direct telegraphic communication with america by means of a cable from brest to the island of st pierre and another from st pierre to sydney u s a the former length was manufactured by the telegraph construction and maintenance company and the latter by mr w t henley the telegraph construction company were the contractors for laying the whole cable on behalf of the french atlantic cable company société du câble transatlantique française this work was successfully accomplished from the great eastern captain robert halpin by the same staff as had laid the eighteen sixty six cable owing to the route this line was materially longer than the previous atlantic cables its length from brest to st pierre being as much as two thousand six hundred eighty five nautical miles the working speed attained on the french atlantic cable was ten and a half words per minute the conductor of the brest st pierre section was composed of seven copper wires stranded together weighing four hundred pounds per nautical mile covered with a gutta percha insulator of the same weight the core of the st pierre sydney section was made up as follows copper equals one hundred seven pounds per nautical mile gutta percha equals one hundred fifty pounds per nautical mile like the previous lines this cable has been down electrically speaking for some years it proved a very costly one in repairs one expedition alone having run into as much as ninety five thousand pounds in eighteen seventy three the direct united states cable company was formed being the first competitor from this country with the anglo-american company 
messrs siemens brothers who had taken an active part in the promotion of the scheme were the contractors both for manufacture and for submersion it was indeed the first really important length with which this firm had been concerned as manufacturers the laying was attended with complete success and the line opened to the public in eighteen seventy five later on in eighteen seventy seven the direct united states company was reconstructed their system entering into the pool or joint purse the latter was established shortly after the eighteen sixty nine atlantic cable had been laid constituting one great financial combination in eighteen seventy nine another french company was formed to establish independent communication between france and the rest of the european continent on the one hand and the united states of america on the other the to english ears and lips somewhat cumbersome title of this concern was la compagnie francaise du telegraphe de paris à new york but it soon became styled in england the p q company after m pouillet quartier its presiding genius the cable was made and laid in the same year by messrs seaman brothers though the scheme had taken three years to reach contract point the p q company in eighteen ninety four amalgamated with la société française des télégraphes sous-marins under the title of la compagnie française des câbles télégraphiques in eighteen eighty one an american company was formed under the guidance of the late mr j gould entitled the american telegraph and cable company with a view to partaking in the profits of transatlantic telegraphy by establishing another line of communication between the united states and great britain and thence to the rest of europe this cable was also constructed and laid in the course of that year by messrs seaman brothers who were part promoters of the enterprise as well as another cable for the same system in the following year eighteen eighty two this company's cables are leased by the western union telegraph company which was practically j gould's property and remained so up to close on the time of his death a few years ago in eighteen eighty three the above system entered the pool the happy destination for which maybe it was originally launched into existence a fresh competitor arrived in eighteen eighty four in the person of the commercial cable company two cables were laid across the atlantic for this company in the same year its promoters wisely foreseeing that in view of the continual chance of a breakdown this was the only way in which they could safely attempt to compete with their more firmly established rivals the commercial company was mainly promoted by two american millionaires mr j w mckay the celebrated new york financier and mr gordon bennett the proprietor of the new york herald with them were associated messrs siemens brothers who afterward became the contractors for the enterprise these cables like the j gold lines stretch from the extreme southwest point of ireland which is connected by special cable with england to nova scotia and thence to the united states one of them direct to new york the system is directly connected with that of the canadian pacific railroad company thus affording ready communication with the dominion neither the commercial company's system nor that of the compagnie francaise des cables telegraphiques is at present in the atlantic pool in eighteen ninety four two more additions were made to the list of atlantic cables one on behalf of the commercial cable company and the other for the anglo-american company the new commercial line was constructed and laid by messrs siemens brothers and the anglo cable by the telegraph construction company figure forty three shows the type adopted for the deepest water of the latter and figure forty four that for the shore ends here the wires besides being of a very large gauge are applied with an extremely short lay hence the elliptic appearance though circular in reality in order to increase the weight of iron and thereby avoid shifting and abrasion this type is now in constant use where rocks ice flows strong currents or rough weather are experienced special arrangements were made in the design of both these cables to meet the requirements of increased speed since the successful application
to submarine cables of various modifications of wheatstone's automatic transmitter the limit to the speed attainable only depends practically speaking upon the type of cable employed on these principles the core of the new commercial cable was composed of a copper conductor weighing five hundred pounds per nautical mile covered with a gutta percha insulating sheath weighing three hundred twenty pounds per nautical mile while the new anglo has a core with conductor weighing six hundred fifty pounds per nautical mile and gutta percha insulator four hundred pounds per nautical mile involving a completed cable main type nearly double the weight of previous corresponding lines the actual speed obtained by automatic transmission with the latter cable is as high as forty seven or even up to fifty five letter words per minute on the previous lighter atlantic cores twenty five to twenty eight words per minute was the usual maximum speed attainable the former say by average transmission and average receiving and the latter by automatic transmission other circumstances corresponding practically all submarine cables between important points and certainly all those across the atlantic are now duplexed a system of electrical working instituted by messrs muirhead in eighteen seventy five which enables messages to be sent in both directions at the same time the result of this is nowadays to practically double the carrying capacity and earning power of the line the effective speed in either direction remaining virtually the same as in simplex working provided the cable is in good condition the armor of this cable figure forty three is also a good example of present-day practice each wire usually covered with compounded tape butting against the next this is found to be the most durable form for a deep-sea cable in eighteen ninety eight another french atlantic line of a similar type to the above was laid this involved the longest atlantic cable section in existence i e three thousand one hundred seventy four nautical miles from brest to cape cod and was the first atlantic line made and laid by frenchmen with the active assistance as regards laying of the silver town company recently too a german atlantic cable has been laid by the telegraph construction company from emden to the azores and hence to new york the various proprietary companies here named have had duplicating lines laid for them from time to time but these it is not necessary to further allude to neither has it been thought necessary to give particulars regarding the methods of construction laying testing or working of any of these later lines following on the pioneer undertakings except where special novelties were introduced for similar reasons and seeing that the responsibility of these later lines rested with contractors the names of their permanent staff acting for them have not been introduced End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the story of the atlantic cable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by avai in october two thousand seventeen the story of the atlantic cable by sir charles bright chapter nineteen atlantic cable systems of today as a part of the union between the old world and the new there are altogether fifteen cables now working across the north atlantic ocean such as are usually termed atlantic cables some of the atlantic companies have special cables of their own from the landing place on the coast of ireland to points on the continental coasts the figure on page 221 suggests one of the difficulties any wireless system would have to contend with in attempting at transatlantic telegraphy on a commercial basis. Some of these cables at each end of the corresponding main section contain more than one insulated conductor. Tariff. 
in the early pioneer days of ocean telegraphy the atlantic telegraph company started with a minimum tariff of twenty pounds for twenty words and one pound for each additional word this was first reduced to ten pounds for twenty words and was further altered later on to five pounds for ten words after this it stood for a long time at a minimum of thirty shillings for ten words of five letters each subsequently in eighteen sixty seven the anglo-american company tried a word rate of one pound for the eighteen sixty five and eighteen sixty six atlantic cables but it was not until eighteen seventy two that mr henry weaver their able manager first instituted a regular word rate system without any minimum of four shillings per word at the present time nineteen o three thanks to competition to technical improvements in the plant and increased traffic bringing in its train those economies in the working which are always possible in a larger scale of operation the rate stands at one shilling a word with all the atlantic companies some day we may perhaps see a sixpenny transatlantic tariff in permanent force revenue the fifteen atlantic cables now in use represent a total capital of well over twenty million pounds sterling a knowledge of the profits derived from each system is not readily arrived at but from a comparison of the traffic receipts or money returns of the oldest existing atlantic company at different periods we are bound to conclude that the takings are roughly speaking very much the same now as they were twenty-five years ago this is explainable by the fact that although the number of messages now passing is much greater the reduction of the rate with the ever-increasing competition of rival lines just about cancels the advantage so far as receipts are concerned roughly speaking however the annual gross traffic on transatlantic telegraphy stands at about one point two million pounds divided among two english companies two american one french and one german company both the two latter are materially subsidized by their respective governments who now foresee the desirability of being independent of cables under english control end of chapter nineteen end of the story of the atlantic cable by Sir Charles Bright.